I am here today to speak directly to the choir. I know a lot of people wish to wake the sleeping, but I find it imperative to speak directly to you. For it is the choir that has the task of waking the sleeping, no? But for some reason, the choir is still asleep. I am one of those people as the awakening is always a work in progress. To think that all the work is done is just setting ourselves up for failure. We speak on one cause, but are separated by the boundaries set up by the same establishment that we stand against. We are still separated by race, color, religion, tactics, important sport team, shoes, music, you name it. We use it against each other. So how are we? supposed to tell the rest of the world how it should live, what it should do, how it should view things, how it should feel, when we ourselves can't get it together with our common cause. Doesn't this always seem to be the case in everything? We have learned everything that can be learned. No one can tell us anything to change our mind. We have all the answers and all the wisdom. But if this is so, why can't we get it together? Where is that ultimate solution that's for all? Do you think for a minute that the same elite that we talk about isn't laughing at our separation, our division? That they feel threatened at all? That they're even sweating us? We do all of the work for them. Their efforts and their end game are at a minimum. Everything is going exactly as planned. It's on cruise control. We make it so easy for them to do their thing. And until we ourselves wake up to the fact that we are all different, with different gods or not, different colors, likes, dislikes, we will perpetuate their message and their goals. This has been their biggest weapon against us. And we just go along for the ride thinking we something special. We are enlightened. But guess what? Everyone thinks that deep down, especially them. So we could do the same old run around in our cause, our revolution, you know, whatever you wish to call it. Or we could do something different by putting all of those differences aside to realize that a real solution must encompass many, not just one, many kinds, not just one kind, many faces, not just one face. Now, doesn't this sound like the logical next step? Isn't this long overdue? Don't you want to progress in our cause? I mean, people ask me all the time, what can I do to change the channel? Or it's, uh, how can we do anything against them? They're so powerful. Well, we give them that power openly, even the choir does. You want change? Change how you view the world. And stop viewing it in the same way that they want us to. That would be a large step in the right direction. That's what I think we need. Stop your normal reaction that you have towards people. Stop. Think, then reply. Be smart about it. The time of the novice era is over. Let's take it to the next level starting in ourself. I'm Change the Channel. This is a message to the choir. Catch y'all next time and I'm out. Hi, I'm Kenneth Webb, or as you know me, Change the Channel. And I want to start off by saying thanks for your support. All the kind comments, all the shared information. I mean, it's just been off the hinges. I um, also wanted you to know that any and all proceeds that I get from this DVD, DVDs in the future, or any revenue that I get from YouTube or Spy Witness News goes directly into the cause. In the last year, I've been able to pay for a nice server host for spywitnessnews.org, a cool condenser microphone, tripods, boom stands, XLR cables, terabit external hard drives for storage. Um, I just got a multi-DVD burner so I can start putting out DVDs, as well as making copies of other documentaries, you know, and handing them out. Now, I don't tell you this for any other reason, but, you know, just to share with you what I do and how I'm doing and, and where I'm at in this battle. Um, I'm just an artist, musician, activist, uh, trying to use anything available to spread truth and expose those cats that are plotting against us. I mean, using YouTube has been a large factor in doing that. I mean, being able to reach people, you know, all over the world, I mean, it opened up a lot of doorways. It's a nice addition to the underground network, no doubt. I mean, which used to be you was on the street passing out zines and handing out your DVDs or your tapes, you know, or whatever. Um, I mean, you still need to do that, no doubt about it. But the Internet, you know, was just a it's a good addition. Now, I was living off the grid last year and um, 
uh, had a lot of peaceful time to come up with new ideas for shows. Um, and as far as shows go, I, the way I see show is just a different format to spread the information. Um, now, it ha has generally been spawned by comments, my ideas for stuff and all of that. You know, these, especially these hater cats. They, they'll take two-hour documentary and only watch the intro, even if that much. You know, maybe just read the title before they think they have debunked the whole thing. And after observing this for a while on the Obama deception last year, Alex Jones' film, um, I decided to do a show about conspiracies and events, you know, that are well documented and provable. Now, present a few facts and see how the debunkers react. Now, I'm no professional video guy, so you'll notice quality irregularities, audio fluctuations, or me just, you know, doing a bunch of effect filters too much or something like that. Uh, it's always a work in progress, and you'll notice the improvement in it all, you know, as the season goes by, because, you know, I'm learning, buying new gear and all of that. So, uh, let's check out the first episode, and then we'll have a chat after. <laughs> channel and this is my new show called Debunk This. The show mainly for you debunkers out there that are always saying that us 10-4 hat wares, as you like to refer to us as, never present any evidence and we just whack job conspiracy nuts for believing such things. Now come on man, you gotta admit everyone believes in conspiracies whether you believe 19 hijackers conspired the attacks on 9-11 or you believe it was an inside job. So let's just stick to the definition. Now what I'm going to be doing on this show is presenting a couple of pieces of evidence of events that happened throughout our history that point to conspiracy. And yes, each one has agreed that a conspiracy existed no matter what side of the fence you sit on. Now I'll limit it to a couple of specifics to keep it simple and to the point. And if you can debunk any of what I'm saying or whatever I show, now I want you to do a, a response video and post it down in the video responses. Now I don't want to hear any BS either. You debunkers are talk to talk, but can you walk the walk? And that's what we're here to find out. The date was April 19, 1995 at 9.02 a.m. A single truck picked up by Timothy McVeigh on April 17 exploded in the street in front of the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building. The truck was filled with roughly 5,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate and nitromethane. About 90 minutes later, McVeigh was stopped by an Oklahoma State trooper for driving a vehicle without a license plate, who then arrested him on firearms charges. Two days later, he was charged in the bombing. His friend Terry Nichols was arrested in Kansas for conspiring with McVeigh on May 10th. By this, it's a fact that there was a conspiracy. Say it with me. Conspiracy. Okay, let's flip the script. The year was 1993, and Martin Keaton, brother of Oklahoma Governor Frank Keaton, wrote a novel called The Final Jihad. And in this book, a man named Tom McVeigh bombs the Oklahoma City building channel has learned of another strange development. Apparently, before the bombing, Governor Frank Keating's brother, Mark, had been working on a novel about a terrorist bombing in Oklahoma City. Stranger still, one of the characters in the novel was named Thomas McVeigh. And on top of that, he dedicated his book to the Knights of the Secret Circle. And you at least got to admit, that's, that's some strange coincidence. I mean, what was this cat, Nostradamus reincarnated or something? <laughs> Now back to the day of the bomb. The first bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. Two other explosive devices were found. I think he said another bomb. Uh, the Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found. But in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. Confirmed uh, through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found. The medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. But it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. And they said it not me, multiple bombs. So how is it that the official report doesn't mention this? Am I just a whack conspiracy nut who missed something and thinking that there's a conspiracy to hide evidence? I'm not even thinking about the why. It's the if and the how which leads to the why. And the if and the how is proven here. Now debunk that. 
not change the channel. This has been my new show called Debunk Death. Catch me next week where we we'll tackle another conspiracy theory head on. And I'm out. Now, this was the first show. You know, I didn't know what the response would be. You know, so I gauged by the comments, you know. Um, I was surprised by the lack of debunking also. The, the only thing a few debunkers said was about the book, The Final Jihad. You know, which I only put in there because I thought it was some strange stuff. You know, it was a news broadcast of it and everything. You know, I didn't put this in here as like, you know, hey, try to debunk this. But I wasn't specific. I'm going to learn the lesson from it, you know. Well, one guy was supposed to, he had a copy of the book and he was going to, you know, send, send it to me and, and let me see that there wasn't or show me some copies or something anyway. But he never sent anything and the rest of the video was never debunked. I did learn from that though. Not anymore will I go in there and not be specific that I thought this was strange because I just didn't. I didn't say that, but it, that's what I was thinking. But anyway, you know, learning progress. Now the next one popped out of the list of episodes, ideas that I had at a list, and I had been collecting from comments, you know, from the first episode. And this one was on the World Trade, the first World Trade Center bombing. Bring it. I changed the channel, and this is Debunk This. Now, if you're a new subscriber out there, um, I'll put a short summary over in the description area so you can check out and see what you know the show's all about. Um, I also suggest you to watch the first episode. And this is the second episode, and I'm just going to jump right on in. The date was February 26, 1993, when a car bomb was detonated below the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. The 1,500-pound bomb was intended to knock down the North Tower, Tower 1, into the South Tower, Tower 2 bringing down both ties and killing thousands of people. Um, it failed to do so, but did kill six people and injured 1,042. And that was the official story. Now let's flip the script and go a little, little bit ahead in time to October. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Correspondent Jacqueline Adams has the story. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. I'm holding 903 pages of draft transcripts. Kunstler confirmed newspaper reports of the Salem transcripts. In one, Salem complains to an FBI agent, since the bomb went off, I feel terrible, I feel bad, I feel here is people who don't listen. The agent replies, hey, I mean, it wasn't like you didn't try and I didn't try. You can't force people to do the right thing. Man, man, see? That's what I'm talking about here. That's what I'm talking about here. If people don't see these things. All right, now, on October 28, 1993, in the New York Times, the headline read, Tapes to Pick Proposal to Thwart Bomb Used in Trade Center Blast. Okay. Law enforcement officials were told that terrorists were building a bomb that was eventually used to blow up the World Trade Center. And they planned to thwart the plotters by secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives. Now, the informer was to have helped the plotters build the bomb, supply the fake powder, but the plan was called off by the FBI supervisor who had other ideas about how to use the informer Ahmad A. Salam. Now, man, I'm telling you, this is a conspiracy, period. Say it with me. Conspiracy. Now, all you debunkers out there are always talking that flim flam about how the, the us tin foil hat wearing cats, you know, just we're crazy. But, you know, with things like this, you know, I, I, how can you think we're crazy? Do you read these things? Do you do you keep up with these things? Do you think that this is just made up? You know, come on. Now, what I want you to do is debunk this. Anyhow, this has been Debunk This. Um, catch me next week while I tackle another conspiracy. I'm changed the channel and I'm out. Now, this episode was re-edited. So, um, you know, the quality isn't as bad as the one that was on YouTube. 
You know, I, I only had uh, the clip of me just talking through with no graphics or anything like that. Um, so the quality is better than that one. And I only, because I only learned, you know, a really good compression settings for videos over the last six months. You know, so as I say, it's always a work in progress as far as, you know, the quality of the videos and stuff like that. Um, but anyhow, I realized after this, this episode right here that, that, you know, I use a lot of evidence from newspapers or news footage and stuff like that, you know. And I always try to put myself, you know, and think like a debunker. You know, and the excuse they'll come up with not to believe, you know. And um, I was thinking that they would they would just probably eat this episode up because it was just basically off of that. that. And um, But I was wrong. You know, another one with no debunking. And I did learn from this one, you know, as far as his presentation is what I was thinking in, in this one. I needed more links to declassified files, you know, for the grit. You know, and then use media for a secondary that's, uh, you know, is supported by the documents. Um, now, the next episode uh, caught the most flack. Oh, man, this, this, this thing caught the most flack. Let, let's check it out. James Channel, and this is Debunk This. Now, for my new subscribers out there, um, check out the description for more details about what the show is about. This right here now and there's a lot of people out there who still believe that there isn't anything wrong with fluoride now, I know you've seen the spam out there from the fluoride dude and stuff like that spamming up about fluoride's bad and people are like well they don't, don't want to even put uh, change the channel don't even put fluoride in the drinking water anymore now, I only knew a little bit about this myself um, before the episode you know I did some research you know and um now I know there's no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, it's factual. It's in the chemistry. It's in the periodic table. I mean, seriously, what what's going on here? And I really want you to debunk this so I can feel safer that I haven't been poisoned or something like that. Um, so let's first look at toothpaste, all right? You know, your toothpaste. If you got it out there, you know, and I want you to look on the back of the label right now. We're going to start with this. We got the Rembrandt. Get it on in there, Rembrandt toothpaste. Let's see what it says on the back. Warning, keep out of reach of children under six years of age. If more than an amount used for brushing is accidentally swallowed, get medical help or contact a po the poison control center right away. Now this is on the back. Let me see if I can get a zoom in on uh, this right here. Now, what I really want to know is what exactly is the amount used? Because they say more than used for brushing. Now, you know, I mean, I don't know. But, like me, I use a certain amount on my toothbrush. You use a certain amount on yours, right? So, I mean, is it a little dowel? Anything over a dowel or a clump? Now, sodium fluoride is classified as toxic by both, you know, inhalation you know, from the dust of the aerosols and ingestion. And in high enough dose, it has been shown to affect the heart and the circulatory system. And there's even lethal doses for a, a, a 70 kilogram, which is 154 pound human, is estimated at five to 10 grams. They, they stop using this in your drinking waters now, all you people in the cities or your own county water or whatever. They stopped using this to fluoridate the water. Now what they started using was hexafluorosilicic acid. And that's what they put in the water now. <clears throat> now here's what this is. It's also commonly used to water fluoridation in several countries, including the United States, Great Britain, and Ireland. It is corrosive and may cause, cause fluoride poisoning. Inhalation of the vapors can cause lung edema, okay? Now, which is the condition of, of watery fluid collecting in the cavities and tissues of the body. Okay, now look at it in the realms of this. Look at it, as, and it, it says that, you know, the sodium fluoride, if you do over what does it amount to brush your teeth, right? Which varies from person to person. 
that is poisoned. So you are getting some of this into your bloodstream over a period of time. And you brush your teeth one time, two times, three times, every time after a meal, snack, how many times you're brushing your teeth a day and how much of this stuff you're absorbing. And I mean, this goes into account for this, right? And not on, only on top of that, but now you in there taking that shower, right? You wash and scrub a dubbing, right? And, and you know, you got it going through the pores of your skin, but now this vapor, you know, it, from this acid is going into your lungs, okay? And causes heart problems, respiratory problems, and all of this, you know? And, and that's just the, this is just the basics, man. They ain't even no telling exactly what this stuff does. Anyway, that's all the time I have for today. Please debunk this. I'm changing the channel. Catch us next week when we gonna tackle another issue that I'm gonna want you to debunk, but you can't, and I'm out. Now, I wanted to mix the series up a little, so I chose to do this topic after researching it, you know? It was added to the list because of, you know, uh, there was a guy who went around and he was going around to the, the first two episodes of uh, Debunk This and it was called The Fluoride Guy. That was his name. He's putting all that over there and that kind of kind of pushed me. It was something different and something to put in the mix and everything. But the buzzers was out for this one. The first thing they were all over was, was me smoking a cigarette and drinking a beer. I know, I know, I know. I, this is... I wasn't thinking, you know, I totally was not thinking. I was just kicked back, you know, you know, I'm off drinking a beer, having a cigarette, shooting a video, you know. But that was a lesson, though, that you can't let these denials have any excuse. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the show, you know. The, the, the second stringers came in about the information itself with all sorts of metaphors to explain their madness, talking about... You know, well, if you eat a lot of salt, a pound of salt or something, that'll kill you too. You know, some, something like that, you know, started going crazy with that. And I, I mean, seriously, I, I just stated the facts, you know. I just showed the facts. But they really tried on that one. But still, you know, they really couldn't debunk any of the facts. I mean, if it says it on the back of the toothpaste canister, you know, to that it's poison. I mean, then in period, it's poison. You know, it says if you swallow... More than a normal usage of toothpaste, man, I've called the poison control center. Now, coupled with shower inhalation and all the other factors presented, I mean, on a daily basis, I mean, and to think it's not having an effect. These cats were right on talking, pointing out the cigarette, you know, really, really they did because for one reason. That's just another of the same thing. The first one don't get you. You can't smoke a pack and it's going to kill you. It gets you slowly over time. Now, the next episode was all more about poisoning, you know, uh, that at a bare minimum there was a conspiracy to cover up the information that people were poisoned or, you know, whatever, which leads to deaths. I mean, you know, so let's check this one out. Change the channel, and this is Debunk This, a show for you debunkers and people who don't believe in government conspiracy. That the U.S. government and this agency haven't poisoned, killed, and destroyed its own citizens for its own means. This show isn't about why, it's about how. And this show was also for the choir out there to exchange information and ideas in the comments section. Also, I know I could do some long documentary covering hours and hours worth of facts about any of the topics that are covered in this show. But I feel that we just got to keep it simple, you know, with a, a few key issues that can be backed by documents and other evidence, you know, when it narrows the BS factor of the deniers. Now, the year is 1991, and it's after the Persian Gulf War had ended. Now, the leadership of the Department of Defense has affirmed to veterans and sworn to the U.S. Congress that there is no information classified or unclassified that indicates that chemical or biological weapons were used in the Persian Gulf and that there were no confirmed detections of any chemical or biological agents at any time during the entire conflict. Now let's go back a little bit to January 17, 1991 and um, after the air war had started in the Persian Gulf Chemical detection units from the Czech Republic confirmed chemical agents. 
branch detection units detected chemical agents. Chemical specialists from the British Army detected chemical agents, and both the Czech and the French forces reported detections immediately to the U.S. forces. Even the U.S. Army forces detected, confirmed, and reported chemical agents, as well as U.S. soldiers were even awarded medals for detecting chemical agents. Now, before I go any further, um, over in the description, I have some links over there on, on this all of this information that I'm going through right now. Um, that you can reference um, it's information from the Gulf War Vets.com to actual documents from congressional and Senate hearings. Um, there's also a zip file of roughly about 80 unclassified documents um, from the DOD on this. Now, after this period, uh, you know, the, the soldiers started experiencing um, illness, which was later um, that they came up with Gulf War Syndrome. And um, it's a medical condition affecting. Uh, many of the veterans of the Gulf War causing fatigue, chronic headaches, um, skin and respiratory disorders, tumors. Um, but they said its origins is uncertain though it has been attributed to exposure of combination of pesticides, vaccines, and other chemicals. Now that's a, a current definition of Gulf, Gulf War Syndrome. Um, back then they there was a big division in the medical community and there still is today there's still a conflict in it um, uh, matter of fact in 1995 uh, Dr. Demetrius Dutropoulos uh, who is uh, from uh, Harvard uh, School of Public Health man he's also a Bilderberger says that uh, when people hear they should be ill they become ill the flip side as it were of the placebo effect. If you're gonna tell, if you're telling people they should be sick, of course they'll believe it. And at this time, also, and during this period, a lot of psychologists were saying it was PTSD and all this stuff was called causing it and stuff like that. Um, but anyhow, I just wanted to give you that to show you, you know, what was going on during this time and and how. You know, people I mean, in the in the research field, the medical field, they didn't have a clue because they didn't have all the you know information. Let's move a little ahead in time to September 19, 1996, in the hearings on the exposure of, of troops and chemical and biological agents. Now, this is five years after the war ended. Now, the DoD admitted that more than 5,000 troops may had been exposed to chemical weapons when a battalion of U.S. soldiers blew up an Iraqi ammunition depot. Okay. Now, one month later, at the Pentagon's October 22, 1996 background news briefing, this number was increased to 20,867. Now, on April 11, uh, 1997, uh, after this information had started to come out and surface and stuff like that about this incident that they're admitting saying happened and all of that the Washington Post uh, reports that it is now clear that with intelligence available to the government since at least 1986 the exposure could and should have been avoided it is clear that the CIA as well as the Defense Department have been complacent in a stone wall if not a cover-up Let's go a little ahead in time, a few months here, June 26, 1997, the Pentagon increased the number to 27,000. On July 24th, less than a month later, 1997, the Pentagon increased the number from 27,000 to 98,900 troops that um, it could have been, may have been exposed to a path of a plume of nerve gas unleashed when the U.S. combat engineers blew up that ammunition depot in southern Iraq in March 1991, shortly after the war. So with that said, so by that lies under oath proven in their own documents and their conflicting testimonies now, it is apparent they conspired to conceal information about the exposure of chemical weapons to U.S. troops during the Persian Gulf War. And only after five years, given more conflicting testimony, changing their numbers of soldiers that may have been exposed from 5,000 to 98,900 over a 10-month period on four occasions. And also keep in mind, this was from a post-war demolition of the ammunition depot. 
This in itself conflicts with the French, Czech, and British reports of confirmed chemical agent detection as well as the U.S. Army's own confirmed detection during the war. Not to mention the soldiers that were awarded medals for detecting chemical agents. Even today, U.S. veterans of the 2003 Iraq War have reported a range of serious health issues including tumors, daily blood and urine, uh, sexual dysfunction, migraines, frequent muscle spasms, and other symptoms similar to the symptoms of the Gulf War Syndrome. Now, I'm not saying why or what caused this illness. I'm no doctor. But what I am saying is that they conspired and are still conspiring to conceal vital information that has inhibited the medical community from treating this illness and has cost the lives of thousands of U.S. troops. Now, debunk that. Now, before I close out, I just want to say, you know, I don't want to hear anybody sitting there and you debunkers out there saying, uh, well, uh, what is there to debunk? Because that's about the only thing any of you have been able to say in the, the last three episodes. It's like, what is there to debunk? Guess what? It's nothing to debunk. You can't because it is a fact. It's just the way it is. What you need to do instead of going, eh, nah, 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 what you should do is just admit it. Think about it. Do, do the research yourself. Look it up. Look it up. And that's all I'm saying. Check out the descriptions and debunk this and of course you're not going to be able to the only thing that you really if you really got a level head you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to you're going to reference all the material over here and then you're going to find out the truth we're going to wake you up a whole lot of people out here we are going to wake you guys up man because it's, it's just too many facts out there that they've been doing these things and they're still doing them Anyhow, I've changed the channel. This has been Debunk This. I'll catch y'all next week when we tackle some more stuff head on. And I'm out. And this episode was just off the hinges as far as spreading the word to others who generally wouldn't pay attention. You know, because a lot of non-conspiracy people could more relate to the treatment of U.S. soldiers, you know, through that time period. And then correlate it with the present treatment that they see on the news all the time. I mean, it also reached a lot of soldiers. You know, who shared their symptoms and stories on the thread that supported the documentation that, you know, that was presented. Anyhow, now, then the next one that just came out and just popped me in the eye for the next episode. is because I heard that Glenn Beck and Popular Mechanics supposedly debunked FEMA camps, right? And I just, I just could smell it. I was like, I could just smell the BS. So I was like, okay, all right, I got to check it out. change the channel and this is debunk this now for my new subscribers out there uh, debunk this is a show for debunkers to do their thing i mean so many people find it hard to believe that we're being poisoned tested on that plans are documented to control and contain us as well as kill us by the powers that be that indeed conspiracies exist and that anyone who speaks of this is just a nut job this show isn't about why they do what they do it's about the fact that it has been done, it's being done. This won't be a show covering hours worth of evidence. We will focus on the element of two, keep it real simple and to the point. Now, all the links to all the documents are provided in the video description over there. You can check them out. Um, it is my hope that uh, some of these can be <laughs> debunked, even though I doubt it. Um, so that knowledge of truth can be refined. I also hope that if you can't debunk this, that people start to wake up to the reality of what's, you know, happened in the past and continues to go on today. So that the future doesn't consist of this cycle of destruction that kills us in the world we live. In. That's right. And the date is today, 2009. And there are reports all over the internet, as well as videos showing what some claim to be uh, some of the 800 plus FEMA camps inside the United States. They report that they're all staffed and even surrounded by full-time guards, but they're all empty. These camps are operated by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, should martial law uh, need to be implemented in the United States. Now, there's many sites out there and people who claim that this is absurd and just more TM4 hat conspiracy theory mumbo jumbo. Even Glenn Beck hopped on the bandwagon on March 26, 2009, where he announced on his uh, Fox Network show 
that he called Jim Miggs from Popular Mechanics uh, three weeks prior to the to the show, and uh, to have him look into the issue of FEMA camps. Uh, Beck then attacked the credibility of the internet by turning to Miggs, who states that Popular Mechanics has assigned one of their reporters to the issue. Man, Popular Mechanics, man. Despite admitting that they hadn't deeply researched the issue, Miggs makes it clear they have already decided that this isn't true. Well, Mr. Beck and Miggs of Popular Mechanics, I'm just not going to take your word for it. I, I think we'll, we'll look it up for ourselves. Let's start with a little history. February 19, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt authorized Executive Order 9066, which is for the internment of Japanese Americans, which refers to the forcible relocation and internment of approximately 110,000 Japanese Americans to housing facilities called war relocation camps. Um, now since then, there has been over 100 executive orders signed and legislation passed to strengthen the government's option to do this on an even broader scale under the guise of national security, national emergencies, immigration, and civil disobedience when they feel is necessary. Now this, <coughs> excuse me. Now this is just the authorization for such actions. Now let's examine how they are prepared to carry out these actions. The date is April 5th through the 13th, 1984. REX-84, short for Readiness Exercise 1984, is a plan by the United States federal government to test their ability to detain a large number of American citizens in case of civil unrest or national emergency. Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and the FEMA agency have drafted a contingency plan providing for the suspension of the Constitution, the imposition of martial law, and the appointment of military commanders to head state and local governments and to detain dissidents and Central American refugees in the event of a natural, national crisis. Um, there has been other master of military contingency plans. Um, Garden Plot is one of them, which is the United States Civil Disobedience Plan 52-2 and a similar earlier exercise uh, titled Lantern Spiker. Now let's take a look at the restructure of command organizations and modern actual implementations of these types of places that we call FEMA camps. November 25th, 2002, Homeland Security Act of 2002 was passed giving birth to the United States Department of Homeland Security. It was intended to consolidate U.S. executive branch organizations related to Homeland Security into a single cabinet agency. There are 22 agencies uh, that were incorporated into the new department, including the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the U.S. Immigration and Custom Enforcement, which is ICE. Now, January 24, 2006. KBR, the engineering and construction subsidiary of Halliburton, has been awarded an indefinite delivery slash indefinite quantity, IDIQ as they call it, contract from the Department of Homeland Security for construction of detention centers for emergency influx of immigrants into the U.S. or to support a rapid development of new programs, national emergencies such as national disaster, etc. And they're pretty proud of their work, says their executive VP, Bruce Stansky. We are especially gratified to be awarded this contract because it builds our extremely strong track record in the arena of emergency operations support. We look forward to continuing good work we have been doing to support our customer whenever and wherever we're needed. Now, I also make a note here that uh, on KBR's uh, news release on their website, they also state that they had the prior contract, which was from 2000 to 2005. Now let's move forward to this past January 22nd, 2009. National Emergency Establishment Act introduced to the House. H.R. 645 was introduced to the 111th Congress in its first session to direct the Secretary of Homeland Security to establish national emergency centers on military installations. Section 2, Establishment of the National Emergency Centers. A. In general, in accordance with the requirements of this act, the Secretary of Homeland Security shall establish not fewer than six national emergency centers on military installations. B. Purpose of the national emergency centers. The purpose of the national emergency centers shall be used, uh, shall use existing infrastructure. One 
to provide temporary housing, medical and humanitarian assistance to individuals and families dislocated due to an emergency or major disaster. Two, to provide centralized locations for the purposes of training and ensuring the coordination of federal, state and local first responders. Number three, to provide organizational locations to improve the coordination of preparedness, response, and recovery efforts of government, private, and not-for-profit entities, as well as faith-based organizations. And you'll have to check out some of them videos on that, talking to some reverends and, and stuff now. Um, before I go on to the, to the last part of, of this document, this legislation that was uh, put in, um, they, they've already been doing this anyway. They've already been doing this. I'll put some video links over there. They've been doing this. I don't know what, what they're doing with this anyhow. But uh, anyway, number four, to meet other appropriate needs as determined by the Secretary of Homeland Security. And you notice they always put these types of things in. To meet other appropriate needs as determined by blah, 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 blah. And with all that said, is it that so hard to believe? Are you debunkers and doofers so hard hit that you can't accept the facts when they're staring you right in the face to the right of the screen? All you need to do is click the links. And then look at all the videos people have posted showing these places. But perhaps they're in all FEMA camps or whatever you or they would like to call them. But by the evidence presented here, they do exist, which would substantiate that some of these videos are actual camps. At bare minimum, you would at least have to admit that they exist to help us during a national emergency. Of course, you would have to disregard all the legislation that has been passed to give them the powers to use these places for much different purposes. But I'm not here to talk about why, I'm here to provide evidence of if and that has been provided here. Now debunk that. I've changed the channel. This has been Debunk This. And catch me next week when we will tackle another issue that you debunkers are gonna try to debunk, but you're not gonna be able to do it. Um, I'll catch you tomorrow night, Sunday, on Spy Witness News TV. I've changed the channel, and I'm out. So I did a lot of research on this one, trying to find things, you know, like uh, that I heard about. You know, like the trains, you know, with the shackles and stuff like that. I found the one everyone was talking about, but I couldn't prove that it was, that was definitely its purpose, you know, it's like everyone's saying, so I couldn't, you know, things like that have made me leave a lot of stuff out of these debunk shows, you know. Um, and good that people will wonder why I didn't put it in, it's because, you know, I'm really trying to keep it tight. I mean, there was plenty of documents on FEMA camps, you know, from the past and legislation for them all the way up to the present. Now, the KBR website announcement sealed the deal. I mean, and, and, and on top of it, if little old me can find this stuff out, you know, how is the Glenn Beck and Popular Mechanics, the debunkers of the 9-11 conspiracy theories, can't because they didn't try. And it's just another conspiracy to conceal the truth and information. Straight up. <laughs> now, after a, a break uh, between shows, I kept researching a, a few different conspiracies and stuff like that. Now, I had been wanting to do one on the JFK assassination, but wanted something new, you know, the, the newest up-to-date evidence, you know, coupled with some things that we already know, you know. Anyway, let's check it out. I've changed the channel, and this is Debunk Dip, the show for the debunkers and the doofers. They can't seem to get their little pea brains around the fact that conspiracies have always existed and exist this very day. Um, that we have been tested on and poisoned. That plans are documented to control and contain us as well as kill and enslave us at their will. The show isn't about why they do what they do. It's about the fact that it has and is being done. And this show won't be covering hours worth of evidence. We'll focus on the element of two. Keep it simple. And to the point, only using scientific and documental evidence that will be listed to you to reference in the video description over there. Today is Friday, November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, Texas at 12.30 p.m. In Daly Plaza, John F. Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, was fatally shot while riding with his wife in the presidential motorcade. Now, I must admit, this episode has been a task, I mean, and I'm not going to lie about this. I've been working on this for a while, trying to sift through everything. There's so much inform information out there on both sides of the fence. 
Um, I've been over the debunkers information as well as the pro-conspiracy information. And, and I have to say that both sides do twist facts and words to push their side. And that's just what happens. Um, I'm not going to go over the controversy about the weapon used. Hauser German-made rifle with the sniper scope sights. That was found on the German built Mauser with the sniper scope that uh, was used to kill President Kennedy, an Italian man Alexei Karchanko. I'm not going to get wrapped up in the rhetoric from the debunker sites that falsely state that conspiracy theorists always say that the magic bullet was in pristine condition when in fact they say almost pristine. No, no, hmm. I'm not going to get into any of that. What I am going to get into is the scientific facts that back some admissions that in fact there was a conspiracy and that yes, a shot was fired from the grassy knoll and this has been proven at a 95 to 96.3% chance, which is basically beyond a shadow of a doubt. The President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, known unofficially as the Warren Commission, was established on November 29, 1963 um, to investigate the assassination of the United States President John F. Kennedy on November 22nd. Its 888-page final report was presented to Johnson on September 24, 1964 and was made public three days later. It concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in the killing of Kennedy and the wounding of Texas Governor John Connolly. Fifteen years after the Warren Commission issued the report, a uh, congressional committee named the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations reviewed the Warren Commission's report and the underlying FBI report on which the commission heavily relied. The committee criticized the performance of both the Warren Commission and the FBI for failing to investigate whether other people conspired um, with Oswald to murder President Kennedy. The committee report concluded the FBI's investi investigation of whether there had been a conspiracy in President Kennedy's assassination was seriously flawed. The conspiracy aspects of the investigation were characterized by a limited approach and inadequate applications and use of available resources and technology. The committee concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots at President John F. Kennedy. The second and third shot had fired struck the president. The third shot he fired killed him. The HSCA agreed with the single bullet theory aka the magic bullet, but concluded that it occurred at a time during the assassination that differs from what the Warren Commission had theorized. They proposed that four shots had been fired during the assassination. Oswald fired the first, second, and fourth bullets, and that, based on acoustic evidence at the time, there was, highly prob there was a high probability that an unnamed second assassin fired the third bullet, but missed from President Kennedy's front right from the location concealed behind the grassy knoll picket fence. G. Robert Blakey, attorney for the House Selected Committee on Assassinations, told ABC News that the conclusion that a conspiracy existed in the assassination was established by both witness testimony and acoustic evidence. And this is also worth mentioning. Okay, now I'm... I'm this could go back and forth either way. You could think that this guy's statement's crazy or whatever, but I just thought it, you know, that it was worth mentioning, okay? So you debunkers and dupers out there, don't 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 fly off the handle with this like you got something to do, okay? <laughs> All right. Um it's it's a confession of a guy named James Files in 1994. He admits that he was the guy in the grassy knoll. And um, by his statements and stuff and his confession to, to being the, the second shooter and everything, um, it, it does kind of go along with the, with the story of the acoustics and the witnesses and everything. Um, and he, here's what he said. When I got to the point where I thought it would be the last field of fire, I had zeroed in to the left side of the head. There that I had because if I waited any longer, Mrs. Kennedy would have been in the line of fire and I had been instructed for nothing to happen to her. And at that moment, I figured this was my last chance for a shot. Um, he goes on to say that he's getting ready to shoot. Kennedy gets hit in the back of the head as he's pulling his trigger. He says it's about a thousandth of a second ahead of his shot. And he shot and he said that he hit him from the front uh, front side of the head just as his head goes forward which is this is this is pretty interesting I mean on a, on a side note from all the scientific evidence I mean w w 
we're looking at it now. I never even thought about that there was, you know, si almost a simultaneous shot. When you look at it, his head does go forward for a moment, then back. <laughs> okay. Which, by the acoustics and, and this guy's confession, I mean, it's, it's pretty bad. After the House Assassinations Committee um, made their report, the National Academy of Science subsequently disputed the evidence of the fourth shot containing uh, the police audio of, of Daily Plaza that day. Um, the panel insisted it was simply random noise, perhaps static, recorded at a minute after the shooting while Kennedy's motorcade was en route to the hospital. Let's move forward in time to 2001 through 2006. The Britain's uh, For Forensic Science Society and Science and Justice says that the NAS panel study was seriously flawed. George Robert Bakey, the former chief counsel for the House Assassinations Committee said the NAS panel study has always bothered him because it dismissed all four punitive shots as random noise, even though the three sound bursts from the book depository matched up precisely with a film of the assassination and other evidence such as the echo patterns in Daily Plaza. This is an honest, careful scientific examination of everything that we did through the assassination committee with all the appropriate statistical checks. It shows that we made some mistakes too, but minor mistakes. The main thing is when push comes to shove, he increased the degree of confidence that a shot was fired from the grassy knoll. We thought there was a 95% chance that it was a shot from there. After these more modern day tests, scientific studies, um, he puts it at a 96.3%. Either way, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Over in the description is links to the most up-to-date scientific findings on this topic conducted by world-renowned, reputable, and credible scientists using the most up-to-date technology. You can't get a around this. No, None of them other studies out there are, are as up-to-date as these. I mean, and it puts it at a 96.3% chance. I mean, and that is, is, is basically without a, a reasonable doubt there that there was shots fired from the grassy knoll. And that means that there was a what? What does that mean, guys? Y'all tell me out there, say it with me. Conspiracy. Okay, so anyway, debunk that. Anyhow, I've changed the channel. This has been Debunk This. Catch me next time when we tackle another controversial issue. And I'm out. And after this episode, I believe the debunkers were starting to get ticked off. I mean, they, they started to realize that I wasn't going to present the things they wanted me to in each one of these. Instead, they found that I presented new things, as well as providing links, you know, so that there can't be any mistakes made. The new technology used to tighten up what we pretty much knew anyhow. You know, now a lot of people will say, you know, the driver killed Kennedy, you know, over the shoulder shots and, and all sorts of things that, you know, I should have put in, but have no scientific evidence that beats the 96.8% correctness ratio that the new research uncovered. I mean, come on, you can't get, I mean, that's just tight. After this episode, I want to mix it up again. So uh, I decided to do uh, uh, some research on some government testing. Change the channel is Debunk Death. A show for debunkers to do their thing, as well as for the choir to have a reference point. So many people find it hard to believe that we're being poisoned, tested on, that plans are documented to control and contain us, as well as kill us by the powers that be. That indeed conspiracies exist, and not everyone who speaks of this is a nut job, or you gotta call yourself a nut job, because everybody believes in conspiracy theories. Everybody has one, whether you're talking about OJ, whether you're talking about 9-11. No matter what side of the fence on, you are a conspiracy theorist. Debunk that, by the way. Now this show isn't about why they do what they do. It's about the fact that it has and is being done. Now this show won't be covering ours worth of evidence. We will focus on an element or two and keep it simple and to the point. Now all these, all links are going to be provided for this from, from declassified documentation to uh, news articles. Now there are many people who like to comment and you know, I know you've seen them, you might even be one of these people. That is ridiculous to think that the U.S. government will poison, test, or, or even kill its own citizens. I mean, uh, 
they say that you're a conspiracy nut. Or they ask, why would the government do that to its own people? And to those people, I have to say, to understand why, one must understand it, how and, and if they're even doing it. Now, through investigation and research, the how and if can be found in declassified material, um, documentation, or pending evidence to the why. Now let's get on into this and let's start by taking a look at 64 years of declassified material dating from 1931 to 1995. Now using any search engine out there that you want to use, type in human experimentation, government experimentation, and you'll get a, a bunch of sites out there that have the same list that, that's going from um, 1931 to 1995. Now, on all of these lists, I went through so many sites that have the same list, but they don't tell where they got this information from. And I kind of got to say that I think that they just got it off of another website and then put it on theirs instead of uh, resourcing this stuff, looking it up and seeing where this information came from. I know it makes it hard to do, but, you know, that's, that's just how it is. So what I did was is I went through the list and I just kind of went through and I picked a, a bunch of ones to cover and then I researched it. Um, so let's start with the 1931. 1931, Dr. Cornelius Rose, under the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Investigation, infects human subjects with cancer cells. Now this cat later goes on to establish the U.S. Army Biological Warfare Facilities in Maryland, Utah, and Panama. And he is named to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. And while there, he begins a series of radiation exposure experiments on American soldiers soldiers and civilian hospital patients. 1932, the Tuskegee syphilis study begins. 200 black men diagnosed with syphilis are never told of their illness, are denied treatment, and instead are used as human guinea pigs in order to follow the progression and symptoms of the disease. They, are subse they subsequently die from syphilis and their families are never told that they could have been treated. 1938, a little psychological ex experimentation here. The War of the Worlds aired on October 30th over CBS Radio with 6 million listeners. And they presented with a series of uh, simulated news bulletins which suggested that an actual Martian invasion was in progress. Now, some listeners heard only a portion of the broadcast. And in the atmosphere of tensions and anxiety leading to World War II, took it to be a real news broadcast. Now, newspapers reported that panic ensued. People were fleeing the areas. Others was thinking they were smelling poison gas and so on and so on. Now, this was directed and narrated by Warson Wells. The episode was an adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel, The War of the World. Now, Wells' adaptation was one of the radio project's first studies. Now, the radio project was a social research project funded by Rockefeller Foundation to look into the effects of mass media on society. 1940, 400 prisoners in Chicago were infected with malaria in order to study the effects of new and experimental drugs to combat the disease. Nazi doctors later on the trial in Nuremberg cite this American study to defend their own actions during the Holocaust. 1942, chemical warfare services began mustard gas experiments on approximately 4,000 servicemen. The experiments continued until 1945 and made use of the seven-day Adventists who chose to become human guinea pigs rather than serve on active duty. In 1969, Dr. Robert McMahon of the Department of Defense requests from Congress $10 million to develop within five to 10 years a synthetic biological agent to which no natural immunity exists. The very next year, 1970, funding for the synthetic biological agent is obtained under H.R. 15090. The project under the supervision of the CIA is carried out by the Special Operations Divisions at Fort Detrick, the Army's top secret biological weapons facility. Speculation is, is raised that molecular biological techniques are used to produce AIDS-like retroviruses. In 1990, more than 1,500 six-month-old black and Hispanic babies in Los Angeles are given an experimental measles vaccine that has never been licensed for use in the United States. CDC later admits their parents were never informed that the vaccine being injected into their children was experimental. 1995, Dr. Garth Nicholson uncovers evidence that the biological agents used during the Gulf War had been manufactured in Houston, Texas. 
and tested on prisoners at the Texas Department of Corrections. Now that the if and the how is concluded, in our exploration of just these, the why comes into focus. Now, although we can reach different whys, we can agree that the if and the how is factual. Now, why is something that we have to work on, but we're never gonna reach it definitively unless we continue to explore the if and the how. So to all the people out there that ask, why would the government do that to its own people? I have to answer, I'm not sure why, but they do. Now debunk that. This is all the time for Debunk This. I'm Change the Channel. Catch me next time when we'll go over another controversial issue that your debunkers are going to want to debunk. And I wish you could, but you're not going to be too. Because as I do this show, I get better and better with with getting my research done and backing it up with this straight government documentation. But I do hope that somebody can say something that it's fake or something, man, and, and, and this isn't really going on. Anyhow, I'm Change the Channel. Catch you next time, and I'm out. Now, like I said in this episode, I get frustrated when I can't find solid references to something I'm reading. I can't stand it. I just It does. It just bothers me. This really pushed the concept of this show. I mean, I saw that list all over the internet, and, and we just we couldn't find any references. So I just decided to pick some out and didn't find the government documents to prove if these things actually happened, which they did. And uh, this show also showed the progression of testing on us by the government throughout the years. And uh, which leads us to think, I mean, did they just stop all of a sudden? Not long after this episode, I moved from um, off the grid out west to the east coast, set up my base operations out here near my older son, grandchildren, and my mom. Now during this downtime, I continued to collect data for future shows. Now I'll put this next episode off from the very beginning of the series because I you know, I just wanted to get this one tight, you know, because everybody was saying, uh, you got to do one on 9-11. You got to do a debunk this on 9-11. And I just kept putting it off, putting it off. And then when I felt that I had gathered enough uh, evidence, you know, to present, you know, a, a really tight show, then it just, and it came. Let's check it out. Debunk this. A show for debunkers to do their thing, as well as for the choir to have a reference point. There's so many people find it hard to believe that we're being poisoned, tested on, lied to, that plans are documented to control us and contain us, as well as kill us by the powers that be. That indeed conspiracies do exist, and that not everyone who speaks of it is a nut job, or else you'd have to call yourself a nut job. I mean, because whether it's OJ Simpson, Michael Jackson or 9-11. Everyone speaks of conspiracies. Everybody's got them. Now this show won't be about why they do what they do. It's about the fact that it has and is being done. Now this won't be a show covering hours worth of evidence either. We'll focus on the element of two and keep it simple and to the point. On November 27, 2002, the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, also known as the 9-11 Commission, was set up to prepare a full and complete account of the circumstances surrounding the September 11, 2001 attacks. The 9-11 Commission concluded that on September 11, 2001, there was a series of coordinated suicide attacks by Al-Qaeda upon the United States. On that morning, 19 Al-Qaeda members hijacked four commercial airliners um, the hijackers intentionally crashed two of the airliners into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, killing everyone on board. Um, both buildings collapsed within two hours, destroying nearby buildings and damaging others. The hijackers also crashed the third airliner into the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. The fourth plane crashed in a field near Shanksville in a rural Pennsylvania town. Um, there were no survivors from any of the flights. Let's start off by taking a look at these commission members and what they said during and after the, the finalization of their commission report. John Farmer, former Attorney General of New Jersey, was responsible for drafting the original 9-11 report. He says, at some level of government, at some point in time, there was an agreement not to tell the truth about what happened. 
I was shocked at how different the truth was from the way it was described. The NORAD tapes told a radically different story from what had been told to us and the public for two years. Thomas H. King, the former New, Jer New Jersey Republican governor who led the commission, said, We to this day don't know why NORAD told us what they told us. It was just far from the truth. Tom Romner, a former Indiana representative, said, We were extremely frustrated with the false statements we were getting. He said in a CNN interview, Max Cleland, a former Georgia senator who resigned from the 9-11 Commission, um, said that it was just a national scandal, he said in a PBS interview. Now looking at all of this, and, and, and these people were supposed to, you know, give us, uh, prepare a full and complete account of the circumstances surrounding the 9-11-2001 attacks. And they're sitting there saying that they were lied to, and then they, they, they published this commission's final report of what was supposed to be supposed to happen. But yet, if you if you look at everything that they're saying, it, it's not. It's not correct. They were lied to. They know they were lied to. So all the debunkers out there, I, that book is false, period. Toss it out. Throw it in the garbage can. We need another investigation just on that alone. But we're not going to stop there, are we? And your debunkers are always saying that there were no explosives used on that day. Well, let's just take a look real quick at, you know, just some eyewitnesses. They believe there was a bomb in the lobby. So I believe the, the bomb hit the lobby first. Another explosion happened. It was obvious. Something had happened right there in the lobby. All the windows were blown out. <laughs> We started walking down the stairs, we made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You want to call, oh. you, you call your mother or something? You hear that? If you're in this building, if you're coming down. Oh, well, I guess they could have been confused, you know, about what they were hearing. They didn't know what they were hearing. Well, you know, well, how about what people were seeing? How about what people saw? How about let's just take not the, the average witness who was caught up in the, the craziness of that day. Let's take some of the professionals out there and not what they thought they saw or what they thought they heard, but what they found. Let's check this out. The plane, it's, 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 it's of, a, of an airplane flying into New York City and exploding. No one's in the truck. The truck is in between 6th and 7th on King Street. All right, Jeff, I'll send you in the bus right there for Westgate. With a mural paint, this uh, airplane diving into New York, blowing up. Two men got out of the truck, ran away from it. We got those two boots on the... seems pretty clear cut. A van blew up and they caught people with a van full of explosives on that day. Now this is not hearsay. These are the actual radio transmissions from that day. And I'm not going to get into theories on this show as you know. I'm going to stick with the evidence that I just presented. And by the evidence I presented, the 9-11 Commission report is incorrect by their own admission. And that there were explosives used and found on that day. Now debunk that. Anyhow, I've changed the channel. This has been Debunk Bit. Catch me next time when I'm going to go over another conspiracy that your debunkers going to want to debunk and you're not going to be able to. Anyhow, I'm out. Now, from the beginning of this one, you know, even when I was even started the Debunk This series, when I was thinking about this show, I knew it had to be different from all the documentaries you've seen, you know, on the issue with different angles, you know. I didn't show the buildings falling into their own footprint. I didn't go into the thermite or any of the tons of things I could have. 
You know, first it started off to prove that the official story was, you know, it wasn't correct. A very simple task. And then I did a little spot shots of witnesses hearing explosions, you know, acting as a pivoting point, leading them to the actual radio transmissions from the police about the truck exploding. You know, they had a mural of planes crashing into New York City on the side, you know. So just in this simple presentation, it, it's, you know, proven that the 9-11 Commission report isn't correct. So they have to stop referring to that as some kind of real story. It's not correct. And that there were explosive views that day. I mean, yes, I agree that those buildings, all three of those buildings were brought down. I mean, but to the bunkers, you know, to, to the debunkers and everything, there's no way for me to prove that to them. But if I can stump them up enough that they use their general one-liners in their mind, you know, uh, a seed has been planted because those fools can't stand to be wrong about anything, you know, because if they could debunk it, they would, you know. Now, 9-11 being a false flag operation, you know, no matter how you slice it, led me to the next and final episode of the season. Let's check it out. I'm changing the channel and this is Debunk This, a show for debunkers to do their thing, as well as for the choir to have a reference point. So many people find it hard to believe that we're being poisoned, tested on, lied to, that plans are documented to control and contain us, as well as kill us by the powers that be. That indeed conspiracies exist and that not everyone who speaks of it is a nut job or else you're gonna have to call yourself a nut job. I mean, because whether it's OJ, Michael Jackson, 9-11, Rodney King, everyone speaks of conspiracies. Now this show isn't about why they do what they do. It's about the fact that it has and is being done. Now this show won't be covering hours worth of evidence. We will focus on some elements, keep it simple, and keep it to the point. False flag operations are covert operations used to deceive the public in such a way that the operations appear though that they were carried out by other entities. The name is derived from the military concept of flying false colors. That is, flying the flag of a country other than one's own. False flag operations are not limited to war and counterinsurgency operations and do not have to be carried out by the ones who utilize it for their means. Now I know we can go through an endless list of false flag operations, whether planned or events themselves being taken advantage of by the powers that be, but we're only going to go through a few to illustrate that this is something that has been going on and continue to go on in many facets of our existence today. I mean, whether it's a friend blaming you for something that they did or governments blaming others for their actions, false flags are alive and well today. On the 18th of July in 64 AD, Rome, the then capital of the Roman Empire, was almost consumed by fire. This has become known as the Great Fire of Rome. Most historians blame Nero, the then emperor, for causing this blaze. The fire broke out in the merchant area of the city and burned for six days and seven nights. Almost 70% of Rome was destroyed. Rumors arose which accused the emperor of ordering the torching. There was also speculation of him standing at the summit playing his lyre as flames devoured the world around him. These rumors were never confirmed. There are also reports of Nero rushing to Rome from his palace and running about the city all night without his guards, directing efforts to quell the blaze. These rumors did not stop and Emperor Nero was looking for a scapegoat. Nero started spreading the word that a young religious cult, the Christians, had started the great fire. The citizens of Rome bought this lie. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request and Paul was beheaded. Hundreds of others were fed to the lions and smeared with tar and set on fire to become human street lamps. Now, the fire had devastated a vast area of Rome and this is where Nero built his palace which he had plans for before the great fire. Now one should not question whether Emperor Nero started the fire or not. His reaction was to blame the Christians even though there was no evidence of them starting the fire. This is the first documented example of a false flag operation in history. On February 15th, 1898, an explosion ripped through the American battleship Maine, anchored in Havana Harbor, sinking the ship and killing 260 sailors. Americans responded with outrage, assuming that Spain, which controlled Cuba as a colony, had sunk the ship. The Hearst Press, owned by William Hearst, who was pushing for war, accused the Spanish, claiming that the explosion was caused by a remote control mine. Immediately, the U.S. Navy conducted an investigation, and it concluded, indeed, that the Maine had been blown up by a mine. 
Spain. The Spanish, however, claimed that the explosion occurred from within the ship due to faulty wiring. Two months later, the slogan, Remember the Maine, carried the U.S. into war with Spain. Later investigations revealed that the explosion originated inside the main and there was either an accident, such as a coal explosion, or some type of time bomb inside the battleship. Divers investigating the shipwreck found that the armor plates of the ship were blown bending outwards, not inwards. Just another example of reaction to blame other elements even though there was no evidence of them doing the action and as a matter of fact was found to be the opposite which was almost certainly new by the US Navy. On February 1st, 1964, Operation Plan 34 Alpha commences. U.S. and South Vietnamese naval forces initiate Operations Plan 34 Alpha, which calls for raids by South Vietnamese commandos operating under American orders against North Vietnamese coastal and island installations. Although American forces were not directly involved in the actual raids, U.S. Navy ships were on station to conduct electronic surveillance and monitor North Vietnamese defense responses under the program called Operation DeSoto Patrols, which were part of Operation 34 Alpha. The top secret program consisting primarily of covert actions against the North Vietnamese. The Soto Patrol Special Ops were U.S. Navy destroyer vessels equipped with mobile van of signals intelligence used for intelligence collection in hostile waters. On August 2nd, 1964, North Vietnamese patrol boats responding to a Operation Plan 34 Alpha attack by South Vietnamese gunboats against the North Vietnamese island attacked the destroyer USS Maddox, which was conducting a DeSoto mission in the area. Call a group of 15, 20 people together uh, from the Armed Services and Foreign Relations to tell them what happened. A good many of them are saying to me. Right. I've been thinking about this myself, and I thought that uh, they're uh, going to start an investigation yeah. if you don't. Yeah. And you got Dirksen up there, and he's yeah. saying you got to study it further and say to Mansfield, now the president wants us to you to get the proper people, and we come in, and you say they fired at us. We responded immediately, and we took out one of their boats and put the other two running, and we kept our we're putting our boats right there, and we're not our running our name. Start to destroy. That's right. right. We're going to go, and I think I should also, or we should also, at that time, Mr. President, explain this Op Plan 34A, these covert operations. There's no question but what that had bearing on it. And Friday night, as you probably know, we had four TP boats from Vietnam, manned by Vietnamese or other nationals, uh, attacked two islands, and we expended uh, oh a thousand rounds. Of ammunition one kind or another against them like we probably shot up a radar station and a few other miscellaneous buildings and, and following 24 hours after that with this destroyer in that same area undoubtedly led them to connect the two of them. Well say that to Dirksen. I mean, you I notice Dirksen you says it's This ship is allegedly uh, to be attacked tonight. We don't like to see a change in operation plan of this kind at this time. And we don't think it achieves any any uh, international purpose. So no, certainly no military purpose is served by it. Now this is an action that we might well wish to consider after the second attack. But I think it would be inappropriate. General Wheeler agrees, and Dean Rusk agrees. Inappropriate to provide the task force commander that authority. There will be ample time for us after a second attack to bring this problem to your attention. You can then decide how far you. And we just had word by telephone from Admiral Sharp that the uh, destroyer is under torpedo attack. I think I might get uh, Dean Rusk and Mac Bundy and him come over here and we'll go over these retaliatory actions and then we ought to... I sure think you'll agree with that, yeah. And uh, I've got a category here. I'll call it to him. Now, where are these torpedoes coming from? Well, we don't know. Presumably from these unidentified craft that I mentioned to you a moment ago. It seems to me State and we and, and George Reedy ought to agree now on a statement that could be made by one of the departments, I presume, the Pentagon. But before doing that, I want to ask your permission to do so. The statement that we would make, I would propose, would simply say that during the night hours, the, the two destroyers were attacked by uh, patrol boats. The attack was driven off. No casualties or damage to the destroyers. We believe uh, uh, several of the patrol boats were sunk. Details won't be available until daylight. 
That's okay. All right, I'll take it. I just bought and put that out. All right. And after this ghost attack, it didn't even happen. The Tonkin Gulf Resolution, officially known as the Southeast Asia Resolution Public Law 88-408, was a joint resolution of the United States Congress, which was passed on August 7, 1964, and paved the way for the United States' involvement further in the Vietnam War. A memo of a two-hour meeting between President Bush and Prime Minister Tony Blair at the White House on January 31st, 2003, nearly two months before the invasion of Iraq, reveals that President Bush made it clear that the U.S. intended to invade Iraq, a sovereign nation, whether or not there was a second U.N. resolution, and even if U.N. inspectors found no evidence of banned Iraqi weapons programs. President Bush told Mr. Blair that the U.S. was so worried about the failure to find hard evidence against Saddam that it thought of flying U-2 reconnaissance aircraft planes with fighter cover over Iraq painted in U.N. colors. Um, he also added that if Saddam fired on them, that he would be in breach of the U.N. resolutions. Now, we all know about the WMDs and all of that. We could just go on and on and on, but we need to focus on a few for the existence of false flags. Now, in conclusion, these things have been going on and continue to go on this very day. We see it on the TV all the time. Events occurring that people will use for their political gains, regardless of if they plan them, have foreknowledge of, or just utilize the events. Most recent, I mean, we, we've had people uh, pointing fingers at Obamacare opponents for attempted bombings. I mean, even though groups like the Pakistan Taliban take responsibility, it's all about pointing a finger and pushing the agenda. So to all the debunkers and the deniers out there who wonder where we come up with this stuff from, I just say, click the links. Click the links and see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Now debunk that. Anyhow, this has been Debunk This. I'm Change the Channel. I'll catch y'all next time, and I'm out. I had that microphone, my new mic in there, so the audio changes in there. Big difference. Um, now, I just started that, you know, that episode by going through some history and, you know, bringing it up to the present, keeping it real and keeping it on target, you know. Showing that these false flags have been going on and still go on today to show the facts because these denials always act shocked and dumbfounded and scratching their head going, dude, where do you crazy people come up with this stuff from, you know? It's just like, it's crazy. We got to keep them on their toes. It's the only way we're going to wake them up. Now, I just wanted to say thank you guys again for all your support for this show and all of my other shows as well. Um, next season will be tighter. The quality of the video, audio, and material presentations and everything, it will, will be better. I'm working on it and trying to get there, you know. Um, now, I don't really have a specific date for season two yet. As things have a tendency for popping out of me. I'm cute. I might start them season two tomorrow or something like that you know there's no telling also before i forget and make copies of this and make copies of any of my stuff just you know any anything i do on spy witness news i got music over there use that music with you feel free take my take this dvd make copies take this dvd re-edit it if you don't like the way it's edited you know you know use it use it for a good purpose and and, and just you know that's what it's all about it's a work in progress you know best wishes to you and your Stay safe, stay prepared, and stay aware. I'm Change the Channel, and I'm out.
Will the real Ben Laden please raise your hand? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رسالتي هذه حول أسرانا لديكم
Means the Channel, and this is Word Turd. Now, fear mongering has got to be the word turd of the century. I mean, it's overused by anyone who wishes to discredit anything that goes against their political beliefs. It's like fear mongering about fear mongering. I mean, take for instance all the declassified government documents that show that they have tested on and killed its own citizens. Now, the name fear monger comes from scare monger, which is a person who spreads frightening and or ominous reports or rumors. Well, I'm sorry, declassified documents aren't rumors. And as far as ominous, giving the impression that something bad or unpleasant is going to happen, that just isn't so, as these things have already happened. Now, a very short time ago, everything like that was called a conspiracy theory. Or you were a conspiracy theorist. Now only the cats who haven't caught up with the bandwagon to hop on it yet still use that word. Now, you'll see it from time to time. But for the most part, it has evolved into <laughs> Everybody's using them, just like they did with conspiracy theorists or conspiracy theory, without really understanding the definition of the words that they throw around at anyone or anything that opposes their political belief. Now, don't hand me that BS about spooky music being used in videos and all that hype. Music and sound effects are like punctuation marks in a video. It highlights points. I mean, if you're talking about bad things, I don't think you're going to have happy-go-lucky fluffy music in there. Now, you can pick any topic about the government and point to both sides of the fence as being fear mongers, and they'll point at each other. It's like crackheads calling crackheads crackheads. Come on, people. We got to get real. We got to get educated. Stop using word terms that you don't even understand their meaning just because it's an easy way out of a real debate about an issue you evidently are lacking any knowledge about. Hence is the reason you use word terms in the first place. Anyhow. I'm changed the channel. This has been Word Turd. I'll catch y'all next time, and I'm out. Bring it.